We've been on a series called Relationship Skills, and, and there's three skills that we're really focusing on, and one was listening skills. Say it with me, listening skills. Where we learn how to listen, and, and if you've not heard the first sermon in this series, relate, listening skills, you should really listen to it because it's changed my life and my wife's life forever. And I think it's changed a lot of our lives that we start thinking, wow, I'm not a really good listener. But the second skill that we're learning is speaking skills or communication skills. After we listen, we've now earned the right to speak. You've not earned the right to say anything until you understand what's being said to you. After you understand, then you could speak. But the scripture goes on to say, I'm going to read in just a second, don't be so quick to speak, but be slow to speak. Let's read that scripture in James chapter 1, verse 19. It says, understand this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Let everyone be quick to hear. Be careful and thoughtful listener. And when you're listening, you're listening to understand. It's a great skill. You learn through listening, not so much by, through talking, because when you're talking, you're just being exposed to what you know. When you're listening, you're being exposed to what others know. That's how you learn and you grow. Then it goes on to say, slow to speak, a speaker, a speaker of carefully chosen words. He says, now be careful when you're speaking that the words are correct, that the words are right, that the words, you don't want to eat your words. You want to think before you speak. And we ask ourselves a question and we're asking ourselves a question, why do we need to be slow to speak? And we're going to answer in one statement. Our words will determine the quality of our relationships. What that means is you don't have a beautiful relationship because you're beautiful on the outside. That means you could be really good looking and have a really rotten relationship. And you could be really ugly and have a beautiful relationship. So am I the ugly or beautiful? That's up to you to decide that one. But you see this, you see two beautiful looking people, they come together and they're bitter and they're angry and they're hurting each other with words. They do not beautiful people on the outside but really ugly relationship. But I've seen some really ugly people. No, just kidding. They have a beautiful relationship. Maybe ugly on the outside, but beautiful on the inside, right? And, and what we want to do is have healthy or really great relationships. And our relationships are going to be really it's, 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 it's based on the words that we speak. So your relationships are based on the words you speak. If you have good words in a relationship, it's going to be a good relationship. If you have bad words you keep pouring into that relationship, it's kind of like planting bad seeds in a field. Don't blame the field, blame the sower. So if you don't like the way your relationship is, it has nothing to do with the way you look. It has to do with the words that you're saying. And I love this. If you could change your words, you could change your harvest. You could change your results. You could change your relationships. You guys understand that? So let's talk about words for just a moment. Our words will determine the quality of our relationship. Our words can cause, can cause anger and fights. Have you ever talked to someone and after they're done talking, you want to hit them? Because their words are causing like, like I want to punch you in the mouth right now. Your words can actually cause a reaction in someone else that they might want to get physical with you or they want to, might want to fight you. They might want to argue with you. You got to be careful. If you're constantly in arguments and fights and people screaming, you might need to look yourself in the mirror and start thinking, maybe I'm causing all this drama. Look what the scripture says in Proverbs 18, 6 says this. A fool's lips walk into a fight and his mouth invites a beating. Now, I don't want you to use this scripture and hit somebody this week. See, your mouth was invited a beating. I just thought I'd fulfill that scripture for you. 
That's not the message, right? Even though their mouths might be asking for a beating, you can't react that way. You don't want to be overcome by their spirit or their words. Now, every time you're running into a difficult person, a difficult situation, someone that is, is foolish in the way they speak instead of being wise, you could be foolish or wise. It describes we're foolish when our words cause fights, cause division, cause major opposition, cause major arguments, and it could even turn into some physical altercations. We're not being wise, but we're being fools. Now, if someone's being foolish with you, doesn't mean that you need to be foolish in return. We got to stop using people as an excuse for our bad behavior. You're responsible for your words. We're responsible, come on, we're responsible for our reactions. No one can make you hit them. Cuss them out. That's up to you. Well, you don't know, pastor, that girl right before we got to ch church, she cut me off on the freeway. So that's what caused you to say all these vulgar words in your car. We're not in control of them. So it's ideas. Our words can cause fights and anger. Our words also can cause anger to disappear. That's good news. Our words can cause anger to, to, to disappear. There's a formula I want to show you in the scripture in just a second. In Proverbs 15, 1, it says this, a gentle answer makes anger disappear, but a rough answer makes, ang makes it grow. So that means when anger is coming your way, someone's speaking at the top of their lungs and they're angry and they're screaming. If you respond gent with, with, with gentleness, you could actually make the anger disappear. But if you respond with anger, it's going to cause the anger to grow. So either after you're done speaking, you put fuel to the fire, fire or you put water on the fire. Gentle words are like water on the fire. That means they might be screaming, but you don't respond in the same tone with the same words and the same attitudes because you're representing Christ. You're not representing them. We're representing Christ. We're not representing who? I want you to get this. Don't let someone change your character. Because they control you. If someone is changing your character, if someone's changing your emotions, if someone's making you act like them, I got to say something. They have control over you. Now, this is a big deal, and I'll tell you why. Because we cannot reach them when we act like them. Some of us are reading some weird scripture, monkey see, monkey do. It's not scripture. Monkey see, monkey do. So it was them that made you act crazy at the store as a Christian. You got ghetto. With the way roll out scripture on the back of your car. That sticker right there is the way we're allowed reaching. All kinds of drama. But we can't reach them when we act like them. We can't reach them when we talk like them. We can't reach them. Come on. We can't reach them when we react in the same exact way they react. You guys get that? So why is it important for us to choose our words and be slow to speak? Because our words can cause fights, but our words can also cause anger to disappear. That means your husband might come in really angry. I am so mad. This house is nothing but a mess. I work hard all day long. The least you could do is keep the house tidy. I know you guys don't use the word tidy. I was just trying to put a loop on you. And then you say, shut up. 
you got two hands and you got a real big mouth. And if you use your hands as much as you use your mouth, this house will be perfectly clean. <laughs> what? You know what's happening? This is a formula. Anger plus anger equals more anger. Some of you guys are mathematicians. Wow, that's a formula right there. It's algebra. A plus B equals C. I see it all over that. Now I'll say this. Anger plus a gentle answer causes anger to go away. I can't believe this house is not tidy. I'm sick and tired of it. Day after day, I talk to you, nothing changes. And then you respond with gentleness. Honey, I understand. You've had a hard day and you want to be able to relax in the house. I got you. We have to come up with a plan to keep this house tidy. We're going to need everybody's help, but I'm going to do my best. I hear you. I got you. He'd be like short circuit and like. <laughs> Maybe if you responded that way, he might come to church with you. But could it be that he's coming to church and then when we come from church, we go back with the same old attitudes and all we reflect is their anger and we never reflect the words of the attitudes and the love and the spirit of God and then we want to reach him? You want to reach all your employees, you want to reach all your friends, but yet you're too emotionally controlled and your words are totally out of control. Hmm. A gentle answer makes anger disappear. And I'm going to say this. We are weak when we allow someone's attitude to affect ours. We are weak. Well, that means we're not spiritually mature or spiritually strong when we allow someone's attitude to affect us and how crazy sometimes we're allowing complete strangers that we don't know to affect our attitude. As a matter of fact, some of them, we never, they never hurt us. They just did something we didn't like and we're already mad. Do you know some of us start off our day right sometimes with prayer and worship and then, but you have such a habit to respond to bad driving on the freeway that you lose your character on the road every single day? But they didn't hear me. It doesn't matter if they heard you. God heard you. You're still saying the words. Praise the Lord. Are we learning something? Come on. The other day I had to practice this. As a matter of fact, today I had to practice this. Let's be real. Right? So today I felt weak because I almost responded the way someone was responding to me. How'd you overcome, pastor? I was teaching this. <laughs> so I had to practice it right before I came up here. This is crazy. Like this is the devil. Now I want you to understand this. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That means you're not fighting against people, you're fighting against spirits. And you're fighting against people under the influence of spirits. So I got a text early this morning. I come on, crazy. Before service, a pastor that's doesn't, he lives in like, like New York, like far from here. He found out that we're doing the drama, the, the, the pit on Halloween. And he says, I got a word of God for, for you. As soon as he said that, I go, watch out, watch out, watch out. And he says, you should cancel the drama. I'm warning you. I'm warning you, like, warning, warning, warning. <laughs> like, I don't really, like, I, I'll tell you my weakness. Like, I don't really respond great to threats. 
Like, I'm just a weakness. Like, if you try to threaten me, I will kill you. Like, are you serious? Are you just, are you serious? You just said, because I'm just saying that's my weakness. I'm not saying I kill people. But I, it's something I, like, what? I could get gangster on somebody real quick if they're threatening me. In the flesh, not in spirit. Come on, I'm trying to clear stuff up here. I'm just telling you the spiritual warfare I was running into. He goes, cancel it. And I, and I, and I, then I, then I, he goes, and if you don't, just remove yourself from being a pastor, thus saith the Lord, right? Like that. And if I, what I'm saying is not from God, let him strike me down and kill me now. These are exact words. So I, so I, like, I, I, I'm ready to text him now. <laughs> but a, a gentle answer deters wrath and anger. So I tell him, I wish that you could be here to see the drama. It's going to be awesome. It's called the pit. And we don't call it Halloween. We call it harvest because we're going to preach the gospel and souls are going to be saved. I wish you could be here on harvest. Right? And then, and then I go, I love you. Exclamation, 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 exclamation. Until all the anger left for me right now. Well, he didn't stop there. He texted me some more n nasty stuff. And I, kept, I, I, and I said, I pray that you'll be, I, go, I told him, I am so blessed. That's the next thing I text him. And I pray that you'll be blessed just like me. We are making disciples of Jesus Christ. It's so fun. He's short-circuiting right now. But all I'm going to do, I'm going to keep on blessing even when they're cursing. And I'll tell you why. Because it affects all my relationships. If I let him conquer me, it affects my relationship with you and it affects my relationship with my kids. It affects my relationship with my wife. And my wife said, what's wrong with you? Did you wake up on the wrong side of bed? No, I reacted to the wrong conversation wrongly. Some of us are getting angrier and angrier and angrier and your words are showing it. And this is the reason you're in the wrong cycle. Anger plus anger creates more anger. And God says, why, why not do this? When they're giving you angry words, you give them gentle and blessing and life-giving words. And this is what's going to happen. You're, you're, when you're speaking, you're planning your next harvest. So what's happening when you're speaking blessing, you know what I was doing? Blessing myself. You know what he was doing? Cursing himself. And I finally text him. I go, don't curse yourself like that. That you'll die. Speak life over yourself and me. Bye, I'll see you. The harvest is ripe and the labors are few. We go back to the harvest. I don't understand. Get, don't allow someone, you could defer anger. Now, our words can cause anger and fights. Our words can cause anger to disappear. Cause anger to disappear. Our words can build people and our relationships. Our words can build people and they build the... So are you destroying your relationship with your words or are you building your relationships? Your words can destroy a relationship. Your words can build a relationship. Your words can be encouraging or your words can be discouraging. You could diss people or you could build people. Look at the scripture in Ephesians 4.29. Do not let unwholesome, foul, profane, worthless, vulgar words ever come out of your mouth. So when should we allow worthless, vulgar, profane, foul words? When should we let them come out of our mouths? Never, ever. Say it with me. Never, ever. If you're slipping, saying bad words, and I'll tell you what's happening. Your heart needs to be purified. That's all. 
I'm not judging anybody. I'm just saying, if I'm slipping saying bad words, is my heart needs to be purified because what comes out of my mouth is what's in my heart. So that means you might need to forgive someone. That means you might have bitterness and hurt in your mouth and it slips, I mean, in your heart and it slips out of your mouth. Your mouth tells on who you really are. We as believers should never ever, this is the goal, never ever have vulgar cuss words come out of our mouth. Vulgar, worthless words ever come out of our mouths. But they deserve to be cussed out, pastor. And I cuss, you know, just to make a point. Because if I don't cuss at them, they don't know I'm serious. So I tell them, I'm freaking serious. You said freaking? Yeah, that's a Christian way of cussing. You need to get rid of that too. Stop substituting fake Christian. Come on, fake Christian cuss words because you really want to, it's friggin' because you mean effing. I don't say damn, but darn if I don't say darn. <laughs> it's the same thing. Darn and damn, same thing. It's just you're trying to Christianize. You want to like, you want to, you want to cuss in a Christian way. You friggin' darn. <laughs> you don't need to say F words. You don't need a substitute. You don't need friggin'. Use God's word. Come on. You Praise God. Lift up. Come on. I am, come on. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Don't allow the enemy to contaminate your speech because he contaminates your heart. I'm tired of all this crap. It's the S word. Just because you say crap doesn't mean it's still not the S word. Well, how am I going to say that then? You don't need the cuss. You don't need a substitute for your cussing. All those words should not be in our mouths. Come on. If God could purify, come on, our mouths, he'll purify our hearts, and this is what he'll do. He'll purify our message, and when our message is purified, he'll convict the non-believer to believe in Jesus, be saved, and say, I want what you got. No one leave right now, please. That's good. <laughs> How many understand that God wants to purify us because we're going to go out there and change the world? This is what I do know. Before you became a believer, you were a cusser. You used to cuss for the fun of it. I don't even see comedy shows with non-Christians because why would I want to sit here and a guy speaking vulgar, foul language for an hour and laugh? Ha <laughs> ha so effing funny. <laughs> that frigging guy. He's so darn funny. I'm tired of all this crap. Oh, Lord, help us. You know why I'm actually using some of the words? So you'll know. You don't need them. I, I've never had anybody say, Pastor, why don't you use more cuss words? I'd love it. <laughs> it would just make you a cooler pastor. Could it be you're trying to be so cool that you can't be spiritual? There was an old preacher used to say, the church has become so worldly and the world has become so churchy, I can't tell the difference. We should be different in our thinking. We should be different in our action. We should be different in our conversation. We, we should be different the way we talk. We're not talking religious 
King James stuff. Thou should have that, that. We're talking about purity of language. So no vulgar words. When do we, when do we cuss a little bit? Even on the freeway? Underneath your breath? What if they cuss me out? Can I just throw a little something towards them? I'm not no punk. <laughs> okay, so it says, do we believe the word of God? It will affect our relationship with God. Reflect, look at this. Um, only, but only, this only, say but only. So never use foul, unwholesome, worthless, and vulgar words, but only such speech as is good for building others up according to the need and the occasion, so that it will be a blessing to those who hear you speak. They hear you. They hear us. Now, this idea, the only words that are supposed to come out of our mouths are words to build others up, not destroy them. But pastor, I got the gift of discernment. And I, I'm like an Old Testament prophet. I just tear people apart. I tell them the truth and let the truth land where it lands. No, you're just hurting people and you have no tact. And you're making an excuse that your words injure, they destroy, and by the time they're hearing you, they're discouraged and they don't feel, they don't feel better about themselves their lives, and their future. We're here to preach good news. Of course, we're not denying we're, that people are in sin, that we're in sin. We're saying, I was, I'm a sinner just like you. And then Jesus, Jesus reached out to me with his love and he saved me and he delivered me and he transformed my life. And the same Jesus that transformed my life can forgive you and set you free of everything you've ever done. Jesus is the answer for transformation. Someone say, good news. Our words should be a blessing. Our words should be what? Bring hope. The other day, I was at a store again because we were modeling our home and we're looking for some tile and the tile guy is there. And he, he's, he's a son of the owner. He doesn't know I'm a pastor or nothing, but I talk to him, but I tell him some of the things that we're doing. And I talked about our missionary trip, that our church just went on a missionary trip. I've been really busy and our church has been really busy. And, and I told him that on a missionary trip, this, something happened that was really cool, that our missions team went down a street that there were just prostitutes on that street. And they told our missionary team, do not go down that street because those girls will eat you alive by their cussing and their words, what's in their heart. They're eating pastors and Christians alive on that street. Don't go down that street because you're going to be abused. But our team, we're from San Bernardino. Can't tell us not to go to what? We've seen darker hoods and... Kenya. <laughs> so our team goes down that street. When, once they get down that street, those girls are pouring their vulgarities and their words right. That's what they do. They kick you right out of there through their words. What's in their heart comes out of their mouth. They're hurt. So they speak hurtful words. By the time they were done, one of, one of the girls basically said this, don't come giving us all this Christian stuff. We don't need that. But if you want us off these streets, we need money. It costs $24 a day to get a hotel so I can sleep in. And if I don't have $24 a day, I don't got no place to sleep. So you can bring all that Jesus stuff all you want, but we need some money up in here in Kenya style. <laughs> right? So our team says, no, 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 hold on. You need Jesus first. And if you get Jesus, 
He promises to supply all of your needs. Let's not get this backwards. You need Jesus. And if you want Jesus and you want to way off these streets, we're having church tomorrow. I dare you to come. Six of those prostitutes showed up Sunday morning. Those prostitutes gave their life to Jesus. They stopped prostituting right at that moment because this is what happened. The words we spoke to them blessed them, got them hope. They received eternal life. They started seeing a way off the streets. And it just so happened there was a new member of our Kenya church. And he has a business that failed. And it's like a laundry service, but he still has the building. So we talked to the laundryman and said, you have a laundromat that's not working. We have girls that can help your business work. Why don't you go ahead, open up your laundromat, let these women live there, and then we'll hire them and we'll help you get all the machinery to get your building going again. So we're buying all the machinery to have, come on, the best, with the best laundromat in Kenya, and we're going to have prostitutes running, come on, running that, that whole business. How does that happen? Words, words, words. We couldn't be conquered by their vulgarities. We couldn't be all of a sudden cussing them out, arguing with them. They're the people we're trying to reach. We reflected Christ. This last, so it's the first, the, two weeks ago, they, six of them came off the street. Last Sunday, we just got reports last Sunday, two more just came off the streets. We got eight women living in our laundry mat. Come on, come on. God is a good God. We just can't be conquered by the words of the enemy. And I'm going to end it with this. How many are learning something today? Our words can cause anger to disappear. I love it. Our words can cause anger and fights though too. Our words can build people in our relationships. So we could use words that are no profane words. We use words that build people up. Only words that build people up and bless others. Only words that build people up and what bless others. We got to stop talking about people because the reason we talk about people is because we don't feel good about ourselves. You guys understand that? So the moment you're talking about somebody that's in the room or outside the room, there's only one reason you talk about them. You do not feel good about who you are. So you figure by tearing them down and bringing, down, bringing them down a few notches in your sight and the people around you's sight, you think you went up a few notches. But nothing good came out of that because it was worthless speech. Everybody went down, including you. So every time you're talking negative about somebody, you are devaluating and decreasing your own worth. You're actually moving down instead of moving up. But when you build people up, not only do you build them up, you build yourself up. How many get that? So be in the habit of giving the gift of life by giving positive, encouraging, and loving words to people. And I guarantee you this, when your words are attractive, they'll be attractive to your Lord. Well, give God some praise. Come on, we're just trying to reach some people, that's all. And the last thing, our words will not just determine our relationship with each other, but our words will determine our relationship with God. Jesus responds to our words. All believers that proclaim their belief and or and all non-believers all believers proclaim their belief and all believers non-believers proclaim their unbelief when you believe what do you do you confess it when you believe what do you do when you don't believe in god what do you do you confess it and i want you to how serious this is if you don't believe in jesus and confess him as your lord and savior you don't have a relationship with him. You don't have eternal life. Look at this scripture. This is the ultimate. Every one of us will be judged by our words, justified, justified or condemned by our words. Why? Because our words reveal our hearts. 
Our words reveal our hearts. If I want to know your heart, I just need to listen to your words. But if you're a believer, you confess your belief in Christ as Lord and Savior. If you're a non-believer, you confess your non-belief in Christ. But based on your confession, will determine what kind of relationship you'll have with Christ now and forever. So not your relationship with each other, but your relationship with God. Look at this last verse. In Matthew 10, 32, look what it says. If you stand before others and are willing to say you believe in me, this is Jesus saying, if you stand before others and say, no, I'm a believer. I believe in Jesus Christ. And when I say I believe in Jesus, this is what I'm saying. I believe in Jesus and I believe in his word. I believe in Jesus and I believe in his. You believe in that old fashioned book written by man? First of all, it's a miracle book. And that book doesn't have any mistakes. And the crazy thing, how God could write a perfect book without any historical mistakes, without any mistakes, any mistakes in, in, in the scripture, and he's using regular people to write it. But I believe every single word in the Bible. I live by the word of God. I'm a believer in Jesus, and I believe God's word is infallible, and I live by it. So if you're willing to confess that before others, then I will tell my father in heaven that you belong to me. See, they confess me before everybody. They belong to me. Because those that believe in me will confess me in front of everybody. Even if there's persecution, there's pressure, even if they stand out, even if they're not like, they believe in me. And if they confess me before others, I will confess before the father, they belong to me. But if you stand, look at this, but if you stand before others and say, you don't believe in him, me, then I will tell my father in heaven that you don't belong to me. Wow. This is a simple statement. Believers confess their belief in Christ. Non-believers confess their non-belief in Christ. So you could say, I don't believe, and I'm an atheist, I'm agnostic. That's right. And you'll be judged by that. And when those words separate you from God for eternity and separate you from all his blessings, and you end up in eternal hell, you'll only have your words and your heart to blame. It was your choice and your mouth. Or we could say, mm-mm. I know I'm a sinner. First of all, I've messed up. And I know I can't fix me, but I tried to fix me. I need God to change me, transform me, forgive me of all my sins. And I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins, rose again from the dead. And I call upon his name. He forgave me. He cleansed me. He made me a new person. And I received the gift of eternal life. That moment I called upon the name of the Lord is the moment I got saved, the moment my life was transformed, and the moment I received eternal life. You better believe it. I'm a believer. Come on, ain't they believers in this house? Let's all stand up. Woo, praise the Lord. I'm going to dismiss in just a second, please. How many know you'll get tested? How many know you'll get tested? Right? What is the testing? What's the end result? Is we have quality relationships with each other. How many believe Christians should get along? We should be known. You know, there was something that was said that was crazy last night after the Dodgers lost. I forced myself to watch some of the post-game conversations with the Atlanta Braves. They don't even interview the losers. So sad. But they interviewed the, one of the players, one of their star players. He goes, what do you have to say about you guys winning? He goes, 
I knew we would. He goes, he goes, I knew we would. And this is crazy. He goes, because we love one another. We really do love each other. That's what he said. And I told my family, did you hear what he said? He's like using a Christian truth to be our Dodgers. Because you know why we win? Because we love each other. I knew our marriage would get through this tough time because we love each other. I know there was opposition, but we love each other. That's what caused me to stick it out in the church because I love my brothers and sisters. I don't run when we have arguments and fights. We're family. Me and them might be fighting, but don't you get involved with us because we love each other. Amen. Don't allow the enemy to turn you into a hater. Hating your church, hating people, hating your brothers and sisters, hating your wife, hating your husband. Because as soon as you do that, you're on the losing side. It's worthless. Nothing's good going to come from it. So now, where do we go? Jesus said this, if you confess me and you say you belong to me in front of everybody, I'll tell my father you belong to me. That's a moment of truth. Are you ready to be saved? Be forgiven of your sins. Receive a new life. I, I tell you, this word that I gave you today is, is part of Christian living. But I can't live this without the power of the Holy Spirit. I can't live it without God. Someone say, I can't live it without God. I need a miracle. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, will be saved, will be forgiven. And how, you know how you come to God? You come to exactly the way you are. Man, I've really been cussing everybody out. Come that way, cusser. I've been lying to everybody. Come on, liar, come on. I've been lusting after every girl I see. Come on, luster, come on, pervert. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I've been smoking everything I see. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, bring your ganja with you. Come on, just come up to the front. <laughs> you know what that, you know why I say that? Because we're all on the same boat. You could only come saying, I need some help. And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, will be helped, will be transformed. And I'm telling you this, it's the greatest life you'll ever have. And I'll, this is what happens. What happens if I give my life to Jesus? God's spirit comes and lives inside of you and fills your heart with love. He'll forgive you of everything you've ever done. No more shame, no more guilt, no more living in the past, the past, past is erased. And they will give you power to live a new life. Powerful. You're one decision away. I'm gonna count the three, say, Pastor, I wanna give my life to Jesus. I wanna be forgiven. And I realize, man, I've been saying stuff I shouldn't be saying, but I want God, I want God to cleanse my heart. I need a new heart. I need a new start. I need a new beginning. Our marriage needs a new start. I need a new start. I've been depressed, full of anger, full of fear. I'm tired. I need a break. Well, Jesus is your break. He loves you and he's given you a guarantee. You call on me, I'll give you eternal life, I'll forgive you, and I'll claim you as mine forever. Let's start a relationship with God now. You come the way you are. God's the one that, God's the one that does the change. When I say three, you wanna give your life to Jesus. You want to follow Jesus. You want to change your life. You want eternal life. You're not sure if you're to die right now, you'd go to heaven. But today's your day to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you don't confess him, you're denying him. Don't let your fear of what other people think stop you from confessing Jesus as your Savior. If you're saying, I've never done it, today's your day. You cannot be saved without a, say, confessing it. I'm a follower. I placed my faith in Jesus October 24th, 2021. That was the day I gave my life to Jesus. One, you want to give your life to Jesus. You're not sure if you're going to die right now, you go to heaven. Two, you want to be forgiven of your sins and you want change. You want eternal life. When I say three, I want you to raise your hands all over this building. One, two, three, raise your hands all over this building. Say, that's me, proud of you, young man. Proud of you, young man. Proud of you. Proud of you. Proud of you. Yes, yes, yes. Anybody else over there way in the back? Awesome. I see in the back over there. I want those to raise their hands. I want you to take one more bold step. Would you give me the honor 
to pray with you. I want you to leave your seat. Come up here. We're just going to say a prayer and you're going to give your life to Jesus in front of everybody. You were saying, when you confess Jesus publicly, he's going to confess you before the Father and say, she belongs to me. He belongs to me. Come on, they're singing this song. Let's thank God. Come on, let's give a hand as they're coming. Come on. Someone's giving a life to Jesus. Someone's life being transformed. We can do this. There's somebody out there. You should be out. You should be up here. They're kind of hesitating. Come on. This is your time. Jesus died publicly for you. Come on, publicly confess him as your Lord and Savior. Proud of you. Come on, proud of you, proud of you, proud of you. We're gonna say a prayer, and if you really, if you should be up here, if you fly, I should be up there. Change doesn't happen until you're willing to do something drastic. Yeah. And some, so there's somebody out there. You're saying, I don't think I could do it. I don't think I could do it. And then God says, I know you can't do it. That's why you need me to help you do it. Of course, you can't do it. But God can help you. Let's call it the grace of God. It's his ability to do what you can't do. Unmerited favor. It's a free gift. A new beginning. Eternal life happens through faith in Jesus. Make a decision. Who else is supposed to be up here? And I want to make just more, I want to make just 30 more seconds because there's somebody out there that's supposed to be up here. And you're not guaranteed tomorrow. This is your moment. We just had this last week, we lost, we lost two young men in our church. One of them they found dead in Rialto. And last night, parents called us crying. Their 30 year old son was run over by a car this morning at four o'clock in the morning. All I'm saying is every one of them came here and they got the same opportunity that you have. But don't think that tomorrow's guaranteed to you because tomorrow's not guaranteed. The one thing you do have a guarantee on, you will die one day. And if you're not saved, it's going to be the biggest oops you ever did. Oops. The Bible says, what does a man, what does the profit of man gain the whole world then lose his soul? Your business is doing good. You're making money. You got educated, but you're not saved yet. You can't, you can't show your diplomas and your bank accounts to Jesus because you can't buy your salvation. It's a free gift. Today's your day. Come on, young man right here. Come on, let's give him a hand. Come on, young man's coming up. Takes a real young man to do that. Anybody else? I'll give one more opportunity. Anybody else? Come on, come up here. This is your moment. Don't put it off. Today's your day to give your life to Jesus. Today, when you give your life to Jesus, everything can turn around. All right. I'm going to make, make sure. I don't want to miss anybody. I'm only giving 10 more seconds now. So I just want to make sure we don't miss nobody. She's coming. All right, there we go. There we go. That young man's coming too. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. Come on. We're not rushing out of here. We want to move with God. Proud of you, young man. You surrender your life to Jesus today. I'm not saying this is going to be easy, but God's going to be with you. But I do know this, that apart from God, your life isn't easy anyways. You might as well be going through pain to get some gain, not pain to destroy your life. It's going to be easy. It takes a real man or woman to live for God. But let's do it. Aren't you tired? Aren't you wore out? It's over. Give your life to Jesus today. And what you're saying from this point on, you're not confessing and walking out. This is not like a gym membership. You buy it and you never show up to the gym. You give your life to Jesus. Show up every Sunday. 
And then, and then your next step is starting at the way. Go to the classes. Become a student. Grow. Learn the Word of God. Because how well you know the Word of God is how well you know God. Go to the classes every Tuesday, every Sunday morning. Get to the next step. Okay, we're going to help you. Join the small groups. Show up tonight with somebody. You just got saved. Go tell somebody you got saved today and bring somebody. Say, I got saved. Come tonight. We're going to have a drama. You got, you got, you you used to, used to hook people up for dumb stuff. Let's hook people up for Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> hook you up, homie. All right. Hook people up for Jesus. Let's pray. Bow your heads, close your eyes. If you Come on. We're going to confess, declare, proclaim Jesus as our Lord right now in front of everybody. Say, Jesus, I confess you in front of everybody that you're my Lord, that you're my Savior. I believe I'm a sinner. And I believe that you love me so much that you died on the cross. You rose from the dead. You paid the price for all the wrong I've done. Forgive me, Lord. Set me free. Make me new. And fill my heart with your Holy Spirit. From this day forward, I confess you. I proclaim you. And I am a follower of Jesus Christ forever. I have eternal life. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand.